Yes, good morning, good afternoon, and for some of you, good evening. I'm uh, extremely pleased and honored to have with us the Vice Chancellor of Baker College, Dr. Jill uh, Langen. Uh, Dr. Jill Langen has been gracious with her time to allow us for 60 minutes to talk about the future of education and how Baker College is changing education. Uh, Dr. Langen has a deep background in education. Uh, she is a PhD from Oakland University in Educational Leadership. Uh, she graduated from Michigan State in Master, as a Master Business Administration. Uh, she got also her Bachelor at the same uh, university. And currently is Provost for Baker College uh, since January 2020. And um, what we, the reason I invited uh, Dr. G. Lange to, to be with us today is because a she has, I think, very good insights, in my opinion, education, but also she's been participating in our uh, program for Eon XR. So without further ado, uh, thank you so much for joining and welcome. Well, thank you for that introduction and I'm so excited to join you today. Yes, um, I, I've seen some of your videos and I followed you a little bit on social media and I must say it's very refreshing to to, to see your view and your passion and your dedication for education, uh, your dedication in the educational arena. So um, the first question I have, tell me a little bit about your college, what's unique about your college and how you, what you do in general at the college and your view on how to implement new technologies, but pedagogical aspects at large. Thank you. Sure, sure, thank you. Well, Baker College is a private nonprofit institution located in Michigan, um, but we have a very large online presence. So we serve students within the state of Michigan, but we serve students really across the globe. Um, we are uh, over 100 years old, so we've, we've got a lot of experience in higher education, and we were really one of the first pioneers in online education. We have worked closely with the Online Learning Consortium, have an exemplary quality rating for online, um, but we, we are dispersed within the state of Michigan as well. We have five campuses across the state of Michigan. And as we've grown over the hundred years, we've, we've learned the importance of things like standardized curriculum, um, standardized student outcomes, standardized course experiences. So it doesn't really matter if someone is in our Northern part of Michigan and at our Muskegon campus or in Auburn Hills, you know, outside of Detroit, or joining us from California or Vietnam or anywhere across the globe, we want to ensure that students have the same experience, that mm. they can achieve the same learning outcomes um, and, and get that same really high quality education. So we use standardized curriculum, standardized teaching expectations. So while we're quite dispersed, we really are one. Excellent. Um, you know, 100 years is a long time. <laughs> I'm just curious if you, if you know, uh, when the college started 100 years ago, what was the key focus of it? Was it I mean, you would guess that it may have had something with the automotive industry, but just a wild guess. Can you you, you are it? spot on, right? Um, we actually started as a junior business college. Um, I can think back in the day we had, you know, secretarial programs and administrative programs. So we certainly have evolved. But I think the one thing that's been constant, if you think about where we started 100 years ago, it was really serving the industry needs at the time. Yeah. And to this day, while our programs and our approach have, have changed dramatically, I think we have stayed true to that core to say we are still serving industry and society needs. Yeah. You know, sometimes you think that we live in a world that is changing drastically and, uh, you know, has an accelerated pace. But, you know, if you go back to Michigan when you started, and I don't want to dwell too much on that, but I think it's useful for the context where we're going to talk about XR technologies. There was a certain um, Mr. Henry Ford that uh, had his vision. It wasn't that the vehicle industry was new. He didn't invent it as such. But what he did, which was remarkable, and I think changed the world, is that he made it accessible, available, and affordable for the normal, normal person, right? Mm -hmm. The T Ford was a true revolution uh, globally, and it had drastic real impact. I mean, if I'm 
aka I don't want to be macabre, but if you look at 90 million horses before Mr. Ford, 10 million horses after. So the whole industry shifted very, very quickly. Now, if you look at education, many say that not much has happened the last 180 years. Yeah. I would I would disagree, but my, my question my question to you is how do you see education today? Do you feel that it's a lot of change? And do you, how do you see it in the, let's say, coming five to 10 years uh, due to technology such as artificial intelligence, uh, XR and others? Yeah, I, I mean, there's there's been so much disruption um, in higher education over the past decade and, and much of it good, much of it focused on accessibility. Think about simply even 20 years ago and, and the real advent of online education. It doesn't matter where you're at. You can be a, a, a working parent who really, you know, struggles with getting out of the house to go to a course to being um, in the military. And, and you don't know where you're going to be next month. You can still have access to this education. So lots of disruption. Um, but I think much of it, much of it good. I, I think the biggest um, changes that we have going forward is as obviously with technology, not just students, but how we as a society, how we as humans consume information, find information, grow and learn, um, that has certainly changed. You know, I am old enough where I remember back in the day when my parents, it was so exciting, we bought a set of encyclopedias, right? Yeah. So I dated myself, <laughs> but you know, that was, it was huge because you had a book and you could look something up as opposed to having to go to the library. And now, you know, within seconds, it doesn't matter if I want to know the name of an artist singing a song or um, how, how to fix my boiler, right? Uh, <laughs> we have access to information, but it's also how we learn. Yeah. And, and uh, you were sharing an example earlier. I don't think anybody, you know, hasn't gone to a YouTube video mm -hmm. to see how to fix something, how to do something. And so while well, back in the day, maybe we were used to just reading. Yep. Now we, we read it, we hear it, we watch someone do it. And then, of course, I believe our next step is going to be, and then we get to practice doing it in a mm -hmm. safe virtual space. So it's really exciting to think about how education can can follow suit. If we as humans learn and grow that way, we need to make sure education um, supports that. Yeah, no, it's, I agree. It's very important. In fact, I had an interview, a one-hour interview yesterday with uh, Dr. Peter Luker, uh, he he was the chief learning officer or head of learning for NTU, Nanyang Technology University. And he said, I asked him the question, and I'm curious to hear your view, but I just kind of share a little bit of what he said. He said that, you know, the way you and I, Dan, we, we are about the same age, learn is that we went to a lecture and there was someone providing us information and then we did tests on that. Now, the lecture is not first-hand information, is second-hand information and the test is testing that second-hand information so it becomes a perfect encapsulated second-hand so to speak experience versus having a contextual uh, connection and that sometimes leads to students around the globe that they don't see the connection between what they learn and how they can apply it in the real world so um so your thoughts on that yeah, I, I've had the, the great pleasure of speaking with um, Dr. Looker, and he and I could, I think, probably spend hours just talking about academics. But but I, I absolutely agree. You know, think about when we're, we're really young, right? Mm -hmm. We learn by doing. How do you learn that, you know, something is hot and you don't want to touch it again, right? And then we transition as we've historically um, become involved in, in formal K through 12 education, where it's been more passive learning. And while there is always a place for lecture and imparting knowledge, we know, I mean, research after research, you know, meta-analysis, we know that by doing, by being actively engaged in a process, we learn and retain more and we can apply that in, in a better way. So when you think about higher education, it really um, elevates students' abilities, what they take away from the institution when they're done is so much more than just memorized facts. As you said, that secondhand knowledge. It's it's critical thinking and its ability to um, absorb that and expand and build on it. So it's a whole new level of learning that I, I find extremely exciting. Yeah, in that context, would you say the students of today are different from, let's say 10 years ago or 20 years ago? 
In some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. But but I think in, in relation to education, uh, humans certainly how we learn and how we take in information has changed. Uh, again, I'm I'm not a digital native, but I know my patience for getting answers and information has certainly changed. You know, if I can't get an answer in three seconds, I, I'm frustrated. And if I can't get it in 10 seconds, I switch. I mean, think about how often we search for something and if it spins, we don't get that connection, we disengage. So our brains really do, and, and again, there's quite a bit of research to say, our brains really do function a little bit differently. Not in a bad way, it's just different. Uh -huh. So when we think about learning, we have to take advantage of that. We have to leverage that and we have to meet people where we're at. Mm. But you said, I want you to continue because it, in some ways, yes. And in some ways, no. Would you expand where you students are not different from the past? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I go back to foundational educational theory, right? Mm. So I think students learn from where they're at Right. We, we know that there are certain things that people relate to the knowledge that they already have. You can in one class have students who know nothing about the subject and you might have another student who's who's based on their professional experience or whatever life experiences have a great deal of knowledge. Yep. How they yep. use that information is going to be very different. Um, so understanding that and designing curriculum and learning experiences that that recognize people are going to come to it from different places. Those kinds of things stay the same. Um, some of the theory about how students learn, we know, for example, chunking is important. And, and again, I, I'm seeing things that I know Eon Reality really builds towards, but we know students in, in chunking information into pieces that students can consume, mm -hmm. understand, master, then moving on is still important. Students controlling the pace is still really important, um, but but maybe how we we, do that, how we support the students is, is changing pretty rapidly. Oh, I fully agree because uh, I, I said this thing to, to Professor Dave, Daniel David. He's, uh, he's a famous professor. He's also president of one of the larger universities in Europe. And I said, students have short attention span nowadays. And he said, Dan, I disagree. I said, okay, why? And he said, listen, it's not so much that they have a short attention span per se, but if you don't catch them, if they're not interested, if you catch them and what you're doing, what you're saying is interesting, then you can have them for hours. A good example is podcasting. Who mm -hmm. believes that we're going to spend three hours listening to two or three guys talking? But if they talk about quantum physics in a way that I understand, I can listen to that all day long or a big battle uh, of, uh, of, you know, Alexander the Great, uh, you you got me. But if you start talking about, you know, UFC, <laughs> I don't see it at all. So you, you lose me immediately. So I think part of this, the, the challenge or the opportunity, depending on how you see it, is for the schools to create, to awaken, not to awaken the curiosity, curiosity is intrinsically there, but to feed it, not to contain it, right? So I think because all humans are curious, I think, most humans, mm -hmm. We're born with, with that instinct. So I think that could be an interesting part. Uh, anyway, I lost my thread a little bit about the question, but going back to this, um, so how how do you see, I mean, you are the provost at this very famous academic institution. What would you like to do with the institution in the coming years to address those changes, but also to evolve and provide a better way to learn, train, and perform? Yeah. Uh. Well, I have a long list, which which keeps everyone very busy. But but I think that the you know we have to recognize there is that core foundational piece, right? That I, I agree with you. S humans and students are naturally curious, right? And there are good educational practices. But how we build upon that research and those theories is changing and will continue to change. I I believe you know online education was a huge shift in in um, education. But, but I believe the next big shift is really going to be to expand um, education using uh, augmented and virtual reality. And, and I'm not alone. The, the recent study that came out, I think it was 61% of CIOs said, if we're not doing it, we'll be doing it in the next few years. So this isn't, isn't just me and crazy thoughts and something novel. But, but how we engage students and how we learn 
um, will will change. We can leverage technologies in ways that that are just so exciting for, for me as as an educator, but for students as well. Um, you know, again, it really just replicates what we're doing in the real world. I had someone who was um, moving to a new state, and they were showing me houses that they were looking at buying. Right, three hundred sixty degree views, so we could really go through and pick which house you know she was thinking would would work best for her. Why wouldn't we be using those kinds of experiences in education if we're studying Myanmar or the mountains of Moab, Utah? We would want to be able to place our students in that environment and expand what they can really understand with, engage them on a whole different level. So I, I think that's probably one of the things that will be a big shift in higher education. And I think institutions are going to proactively have to determine how can they best leverage it? How can they make it accessible for everybody? Mm. No, it's true. It's very, very much true. Uh, just a little thing. You can hear a little bit of a um, sound there. So you have the mute button. If you can just mute it for a second and unmute it, then you you can it because you it, it builds yeah. a little echo. Oh, okay. Now it's much better. Okay. Still, so and a slightly lower volume. Yes, um, I, we, you and I did a, a little prep here before, <laughs> and I said that um, I would share some of the. We just released the 9.0, so you know, the cat is out of the bag. We had a big party with many, many people, and and now, um, and then there were two or three features there that for me were, and I want to be careful with words here, but really groundbreaking, but it, that's Dan the geek talking. So I would like someone sober from an education perspective to give you your thoughts and please be straightforward. So for me, so let's prep this a little bit. So what we've done for the better part of 20 years is that we went to the real world and extracted information, create basically digital twins, if you will, uh, of the physical environments and injected uh, intelligence behaviors so we can create simulators. Originally, 36 years ago, that's all I, all I was doing, doing a simulator for the, for the aircraft. But, but as the technology became cheaper, faster, better, now you could do it for nursing, you can do it for uh, me mechanical engineering. And the idea with this virtual world provides you with a sandbox, if you will, where you can learn, train, perform in a much more immersive way. So, so far, so good, that's what we've done. And our focus has been to make it easy to create, easy to use, and as I said, easily to accessible, affordable, et cetera. But now, and here's where it gets a little bit scary. What you're, I'm gonna show you now is the capability to take the digital world, what you created with all the annotation and richness and inject it in the physical world, inanimate objects that today are dead. They have no information, but they now are injected and be, with information become information rich. And that's a total different way to look at the world. And thanks to today, you can use the phone to do it. I'll show you that in a few seconds. Uh, but very soon, thanks to partners like, for example, uh, Facebook, like uh, Apple, like Microsoft. Microsoft got a $21 billion order to, to change the way we train our army. Uh, Facebook is dedicating 10,000 workers to create the new glasses. And so does Apple even more. So thanks to these partners, rather than just using your phone very soon, we'll use our glasses. But for now, okay, I talk too much. So now let me show you the video and, and then I'll share three videos and then I want your thoughts. Okay, let's go. So you're gonna get a little ghost effect here for just a second and then it's gonna disappear. And uh, I should be able to do this. Okay, can you see my screen? multiple screens, I hope. Hello? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, very Sorry, good. I was doing a thumbs up, but you can't see that. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I can't see you now. Okay, so um, let me prep it just slightly. So we are right now in a little home studio that I made of the atelier. So my hobby is painting. So what you're looking at, I'm trying to slowly turn it around, is a scan of this room. And the scan of this room is something that I've done using a phone. So everything you see here in the next uh, 60 to 90 seconds is done with a phone. So the first thing uh, we've done is to create a digital twin of the physical room. So fasten your seatbelt, it's gonna go pretty quick, let's go. 
So there you Lacquered see. Lacquered food container with handle, made of woven bamboo thread and coated with red, black, and green lacquer. So that was annotation. This is a digital copy of my boiler to do maintenance repair operation. So I know how I restart it because it's a gas boiler. And if you don't do it right, it may explode. And then I always have sometimes problem with my internet. So what you see here is I create a digital copy of the room where I have the internet and also, there you go, that's the digital copy and also the audio systems and all this cable that are very confusing. But now, when I have the digital copy, and that's the copy, it's not the real one, you can see it's transparent. I can overlay things in it with the digital copy and map the digital copy to the physical product. So now that I have the copy, I want to illuminate it. I want to bring it to life and um, not the virtual world, but the physical world. So you can see that I'm switching between physical and virtual. They are over each other, overlapped. And then I create the instructions. Just to just jump over there. Uh, to the first stop, who's going to be here? There's a number of mechanical um, devices. It's the crocodile, uh, handmade crocodile that I use for the atelier. One is drilling, and the other one here that you see has to do with it's a DC motor for polishing stuff and reliefs are created. So I hope you're going to enjoy the tour. So that was a clip of a longer tour. So once I have the digital world, I overlay, I can put the digital world to make it invisible. So all the, all my remains is the annotation and the information in the physical world. And now I can start doing what you saw there, which is a step-by-step -step procedure or a guiding tour if it's, this is a museum or a repair operation if this is a factory or you know how to use a ventilator this is a hospital so now the last video and then i'll stop is looking at this world i don't want to keep it for myself uh, so everybody that was is in this room can bring their phone and see the illuminated version but if you are in sweden or in michigan you are able also to come into this room by using what we call uh, uh, spatial XR meetings. So not face like we do now, but we, they are invited. So I invited two gentlemen. One is my CTO, another one is uh, one of the product managers from Sweden. And they are using this very simple avatar to look around. And the way they navigate my room is they actually physically work, but not in this room. Uh, they work wherever they are. And, but as they bend their knees and look on the tables, they see that in our virtual world. A little bit difficult to wrap your mind around, but let's have a look. So first we set up the meeting with Europe. We share first the scale version so they don't get confused, so they know where we're gonna walk. Then we expand the room, life size. And now they are walking in this virtual real room. <laughs> uh, and uh, for me, this is pretty mind boggling. Whether you do this for tourism, I live in Laguna Beach, so you can actually go and look at statues there later this afternoon or what have you. Okay, so that was a little commercial, but at the same time, not so much commercial. I'm generally interested to hear your thoughts, what you think this can be used for and what you think this type of technology can help with. Thank you. Yeah, that was so exciting. Thank you. Um, so in, in regards to how it can be used, when we first started talking about using extended reality and someone asked me the question, said, well, which program do you think, you know, could use this? And my answer was, what program couldn't it, right? I mean, there, there are just so many different applications to that, whether it's, it's funny to use the example of, of the internet um, within our IT program, within cyber defense, obviously in the area of health science and, and medical education, and I think about having that safe space, that risk-free environment where students can first get comfortable, whether it's the first time they enter um, a surgery room and it's a search tech program, right? By the time they then are physically walking into a hospital, they feel comfortable. They've had that experience. Or the first time you're you know, drawing blood or doing anything, 
having that safe space to do that. But we also offer criminal justice, right? So looking at a crime scene analysis or interacting with people, it's, it's just, it's so exciting. Particularly, I think in our general education courses, we focused a lot on obviously whatever the general education topic is. It could be math, science, English, social sciences. But threaded through all of that, it is really important to understand and have a global perspective. And so there is something about not just reading about another country or another culture or another experience, but when you can actually put someone in that environment and they, they maybe you're studying at temples in Cambodia, I was looking at some, it's one thing to see the culture, but when you can see the landscape around you, when you can see what people are wearing, when you can hear the dialogue going on, it's an immersive experience that, that creates a, a whole different kind of learning environment. So being able to be in that environment is, is just incredibly powerful. Uh, I think about sorry. having someone else with you too is critical. We know um, that learning is a social activity. And we know that community of inquiries is critical. When you can truly feel like you are with someone in that environment, um, it, it builds upon everything we know that's that's important in learning in learning experiences and in learning environments. So I loved, even though it's only an avatar, I, I loved seeing that person with me using nothing more than my phone. Yeah. Now, and by the way, the avatar will be much real in the next release. But but now uh, that's that's technology always better. But no, but what you just said now is exactly what I heard from Dr. Luca yesterday, right? That we are migrated to contextual knowledge. We are migrated to first-hand experience, first-hand knowledge. Um, but I, but I, I'm so happy to hear this about th that we are curious about different nations. I'm packing my bags and we are going. My wife and I are going to South Korea uh, mm -hmm. soon this month. And uh, actually on my birthday, but but uh, we are going because we invited. Uh, it, it's not only fun; we're gonna have fun. But we invited by um, uh, by the government there to. They have a Asian leader forum. There's gonna be a lot of famous people. For some reason, they want me to speak. But my point is that as I'm going there, I'm gonna go up in the mountains in Korea, and you know, it's a very mountainous island, the country, right? So the uh, and the peninsula, I should say. And so. So I, I'm planning to scan a lot of things and bring home. And uh, this month we are launching a global competition because this year we got 72 countries to join. So everybody using their phone because that's a that's the democratic thing. Even so, we have places now in Harare. I've never been to Harare. In Ghana, uh, in Laos, uh, that are now tasked to capture the local knowledge, things that they are proud about. And something that I'm super happy about is uh, we got our first nation in Canada. So this tribe wants to preserve their language. Now, immediately I start thinking, wait a second, we can annotate the physical world in whatever language there is, right? So they can hear how it's pronounced uh, and kids learn in a very contextual world. You just run around, mm -hmm. send them out with the phone in a scan area and they can learn. So I think, yes, my, my mind starts to to you know, almost explode. But I think the key now, the, the, now Dan, the engineer, the logical person says, we need to work with visionaries like you to make this happen practically and to put it in a contextual level. The technology is just an enabler. It's just a sandbox. That's not the solution. The, 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 the merging of your know-how, your expertise, where you see what's important or not with such technology, that's where we can make one plus one a ten. So, um, so, so that's uh, okay. Let's switch gear. I read a report that our brain, it made studies have changed. That our brains are plastic, mm -hmm. and people now. You mentioned that you, if you don't hear in three seconds, you lose your. <laughs> they are much more. The IQ has essentially increased if you measure the amount of data they can um, get into the eyes. So my question to you is, first of all, I assume you agree. And um, what's gonna happen? Because today we say the kids should not be more than six hours. What is gonna happen when in three years now, Apple launches their devices, their glasses, and these glasses know who you are, where you are. They know how much you slept. They have the ring like this, if you're on a 
irritable mode or in a good mode. <laughs> and they can serve you information when you need it, as you need it, in the context that you need it. Let's say that may take five years, not three years, but they will be there and they will do this. What happens with the role of education? We kind of touched based on that, but because obviously knowing things, memorizing things out the window, right? So, so what is the role of a teacher in this new world? Yeah, wow. There's a, there's a lot of great questions to uh, to unpack in there. You, you know, um, again, be, being a, of our generation, some of that change is a little bit overwhelming, and and our reaction could be to stick our head in the sand and say it's not going to happen. But as educators, we can't say that, right? We just have to take a deep breath and say, okay, let's let's think about how we can build upon this. There are some scary parts of someone knowing that much about us, but you know, we'll we'll have to figure out how to manage that. From an educational standpoint, though, it again, it, it isn't that different. Think about how we've used AI in education already. I yep. was speaking with someone today uh, about a course. Uh, it was an anatomy and physiology course where we were using a program where students were doing self-assessments and if they you know, got to a certain level, they went on to the next content. But if they didn't, it would automatically feed them information and questions about the areas in which they were weak, where they needed to build upon it. So, yeah. so we're doing that. Now we're just saying it's gonna expand upon it. It is feeding, in an educational setting, we can feed students what they need to, to know. Again, if we have someone who's a, at a, a, had a great deal of expertise, they, they might move quickly through the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Someone who's stuck in an area might then get fed additional curriculum. It's it's a way of personalizing and tailoring education. We can all work towards the same outcomes, the same content that we need to master. But mm -hmm. how we do it, my experience in the very same class with the very same outcomes might be very different. Dan, you've traveled far more than I have. So I might need some remedial information. You might be ready to move on. We don't have to do that at the same pace. So personalization is, is powerful in education. Yeah. Yeah. We just have to figure out how to do it. Yeah, you know, and I'm an eternal optimist because let me switch the, and get a dark view for a change. So many of us have gone to a terrible year, a year and a half that has left enormous amount of small family business that have been successful for decades, you know, out, out of business. People have suffered financially, economically, health-wise. They lost their ones. Uh, education, uh, I mean, if I'm looking, many teachers in their situation, put myself in their shoes, uh, they are all stressed, overworked. Now they have to redo everything in, in, in weeks, right? And now this gentleman from Sweden comes to me and says, Oh, by the way, now virtual reality, <laughs> you must have it. My knee jerk reaction would be, listen, Dan, with all due respect, I barely have energy and time to just cope with the switch to Zoom, right? And that itself has been a tremendous stress on us. You ask me now to change one more time, forget about it. I'm not going to do it. So that's been my experience. But here's the optimis optimistic side of Dan. I'm thinking, and I want your thoughts on it. What I discovered is that part of this is about engagement. To, how do we get the student engaged? Because if we get them engaged, then we have them. They are not putting mute. Wow, do you hear that? Thunder, Thunder Laguna Beach. That's almost a oxymoron. That doesn't happen. So I hope we gotta not see uh, things like that. Anyway, so going back to my point, is that, you know, when they discover that the alternative of putting TikTok videos on the side and doing something completely different versus paying attention, when you give them an assignment and say, please, for mechanical engineering, your assignment until Thursday is to do a lesson on how the combustion uh, chamber works and I want all the materials. I know, and they discover now that, wow, 80% of the time the students is engaged they have to do less. And now they can really use their skills because one thing that will never go away, in my opinion, with technology is the mastership, right? The experience. What I, if I was a teacher, when I was a PhD and I was studying and I was had to teach, the best part was actually the conversation, right? Not to preach, but 
to give them the wisdom, navigate the knowledge. So I think this sandbox, this technology can help them to lessen their stress, <laughs> uh, allow, make the, make them more, more, let's say, successful in getting what they need and using their high level of knowledge. That's what I, that, that's my optimistic side. So I gave you two pictures here, the negative and the positive, blue pill, red pill. Take it away. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> well, I, I can say this past year, right, has, has certainly been a change. Our experience with our faculty has been that we've maybe accelerated some of the adoption um, we were already fairly um, committed to using technology. All of our courses, regardless of the delivery method, used their learning management system. But the feedback that we got at the end of the year was that people said, oh, no, don't give me one more thing. It's please give me more because I've learned how much it helps me. Right. Mm -hmm. So once folks got over that initial, all of this is remote, they saw how technology can help. You know, for example, I, I know we'll talk about Zoom fatigue and Zoom meeting fatigue, but can you imagine what this year would have been like if we didn't have it? Oh, oh my gosh, everything would have stopped. Education, yeah. business, uh, family relationships. So while it was horrible, technology at least kept us connected. So yeah. our faculty have said it's it was tough, but it's been a savior. Please give me more. Um, wow. So I'm, a, I'm on the positive side there. Um and then from the student standpoint, you know, there's the really old saying, he who does the work does the learning. Mm -hmm. And um, it's so true. I, I can I can read about someone else doing it. I can watch someone else do it or I can do it. And again, it has to be in a sandbox, safe environment. Um, but, but it's just so much more powerful. And when I was I think one time I was talking to, to Peter Licker and I said, the fact that the, this platform is so accessible that actually students can use it to create lessons is a little bit like tricking your kids to eat vegetables. They're so excited about creating materials that could be used to teach someone else how to do something. They're forgetting that they have to master it so that they can teach someone else to do it, but they're having fun. It's We're, we're, we're tricking them into eating their vegetables. It's, it's um, a win-win because they're completely immersed, engaged, but not necessarily feeling like they're stuck having to master all this. Mm -hmm. They're just excited. So, um, yeah. And it could be done on a platform that is accessible, but also um, possible for your, you know, I'll say your average person to, to use. I am not the IT wizard. Um, so I can tell you that the first, the very first time I used it and I was playing with it, I, I, was, I was just lost for a couple of hours. And as we were talking about bringing it on at Baker, you know, everybody has their strengths and weaknesses. And when I said in, in a matter of an hour, I created a very basic lesson with a tea kettle. It was nothing, I mean, but I could do it. People was, if she can do it, I can do it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, uh, it's, it, I like the one that you'll got lost for several hours because it happens <laughs> to me daily, right? So my little treat, because of course I'm, I'm, happen to be the CEO and the chairman, so I have to do serious stuff, right? I mean, I have to be in boring meetings and I have to look at Excel sheets. And But I do agree with Elon Musk that CEOs today spend far too much time on, you know, formalia things and far too little time on their core product, right? And I think the same applies in education, it applies in any line of activity. So in my case, come back to my treat, is that I have these three hours almost every day when I just play, like a four years old. And I try everything and I'm going to different objects. So this afternoon, as I said, I, I, I've reserved three hours to go down to Laguna. And as, as if you be, you've been to Laguna, right? And there's a lot of art, right? There's 300 drunken um, artists that form this village. So this I haven't seen the density of art galleries, sculptures. So what I'm trying to do is to create a virtual museum and kind of have people to visit. So that's gonna be my little treat for today. And, but if I'm thinking like this, I was thinking if I would be passionate, let's say for mechanical engines, or if I was passionate about history, right? Uh, and I happen to afford to be able to see, I don't know, go to Washington, right? Uh, things like that. So I think, I hope this has a contagious, because I think if we can awaken that curiosity for students, 
and we can be, give them some type of guidelines how to solve problems in that context. Because there's two parts. One is curiosity, but the other, in my humble opinion, is how do I, that's what I learned in school. How do I address the problem, whatever that problem is, and, and, and can solve it. And this could be a sandbox to there. Sorry, I talk too much because I'm passionate. And I notice our clock, we're doing pretty fine. We are still there. I don't want to take too much of your time. now. Uh, I interviewed one of your faculty members and she was very nice and shared with us uh, some insights uh, from the usage. Uh, I, I don't know if you had a chance to look at that. Uh, mm -hmm. No? Okay, I'll send you a copy afterwards. But this is what she said. I started with this, I was intimidated <laughs> because I, you know, I'm not an IT manager. Then I start to play with it and I realized that, wait a sec, I should probably play it rather than, I don't have it right now, but I'll send it off. I play with it and then I start to realize, wow, I can do this. And then I thought a little bit longer and say, wait a second, my students can do this. So that's exactly what you said. Okay, um, so we talked about challenges. We talked about today's education. We talked about the future. Um, how about, this has nothing to do with technology, but the educational system in the United States is very different from the one I went to. In my case, I, I, I took my master, two masters and never finished my PhD, but it was all free. <laughs> I never paid anything for that. Um, while in our case, education costs have ballooned to the extent I have two kids, one went to UCLA, et cetera. Right. How do you see that? Do you see a transformation in that area as especially with regard to colleges. And what, what's your view on that? I'm curious. Yeah, there's been a lot of conversation um, and, and probably a lot of questioning about the value of a higher education. And, and it's hard for me as an educator to hear that, but it's also a good conversation because it, it forces us to come back and say, and ask ourselves, what is the value of education? You know, it, it's funny because you could say, well, I could spend $40,000 and buy a new vehicle. And the second I drive it off the lot, it depreciates. Or I could invest $40,000 in my education. And we know that the ROI will pay off, right? The, the statistics and the, and the numbers don't lie. Um, but we have to make sure that there is value. And to do that, we have to really prepare students, right? If there's going to be a value in learning, and, and I'm, again, the geek that would say, I could just go to school forever. I, I think learning in and of itself is a powerful thing. And much of what we do as educators is simply to help students learn how to learn. Yeah. Right? Critically think, be curious. How, how do I learn? Um, but, but it comes back to that. We have to make sure that we're providing a value. And that means we have to make sure students learn how to learn. We have to make sure that they understand the concepts that are going to be critical for the profession um, or their place that they want to take in the world. And, and so we have to find ways to be innovative and make sure that we're continuing to provide that value. And so it is hard to say, if you're going to invest this much money, you're going to sit in a classroom of 200 students and sit and passively hear someone talk mm -hmm. for 16 weeks. That, that's a hard argument to say, where's the value in that? versus I'm going to give you a variety of experience. I'm going to flood you with resources and I'm going to let you practice and immerse yourself and, and build not just a, a knowledge base of terms, but, but a way to critically think and, and, and just feed that curiosity. So again, you know, education isn't inexpensive in the United States. We just have to make sure that it provides the value. Um, Do you think the proximity to to the future jobs, the proximity to companies, uh, and I'm not talking necessarily technology companies, but there's so many exciting areas in bio, biology, in uh, mm -hmm. manufacturing, in space exploration. I mean, there, I can. There's a long list of very exciting areas uh, where the academic institution needs, needs to be nimble and quickly adapt for whatever the new jobs are required and the new open fields. And this 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 must be a I assume, and I, again, I'm, I'm talking from a perspective of ignorance because I'm not in that field, that, but that must be a challenge for you. So that's why learned, how to learn is far more important than learn how to do a specific thing, I assume. But at the same time, you need to put it reasonably in a context that it will make that person ready for a 
a good job, so to speak, a, a future job. Yeah, thoughts? It's, it's a balance, right? Mm -hmm. it, there's this piece that says we need students to learn how to learn. They have to be able to critically think. They have to problem solve. They have to know how to find uh, information, you know, quantitative and qualitative literacy. How do I use numbers? But there is also this piece that says, but we do need to prepare them when they graduate for a specific field, right? Mm -hmm. And regardless of the industry, it's it's changing. And, and that is a challenge, right? You, you cannot teach curriculum from 10 years ago. You just can't. So we've designed systems and processes and leveraged platforms that allow us to update quickly, change quickly. Again, think back in the day when, you know, you had this published textbook and used it for five years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can you imagine even in accounting, right? The, the laws change. You can't do that. Technology changes. So, you know, there are certain, certain areas where, you know, the body parts of the body parts. Yeah. But again, yeah. uh, there's better and more engaging ways to, you know, do that rather than just a picture in a book. But we, we try to use a lot of open educational resources. We try to use platforms that make it really easy to shift and change. So e even, you know, in this situation where we're using extended reality, if, if it required, you know, a great number of people or resources or money to update that, it would be a challenge because we have to update our curriculum frequently. Um, the platform that you use has to say, I could go in and spend an hour and change this and make it look like this, put a different model in, put a different technique in, and we're good to go. Because the world moves that quickly today. Um, and, and that was really one of the things that we looked at when, when we went down this road to say, if, if we go down here, are we going to create something that's static for five years? It's mm. not going to work. Mm. Now, I, I was very excited when uh, you know, we heard about your strategy and Frank, uh, my colleague, shared that with me. And uh, I can tell you, for me, for us, I've been in this business now for 36 years, 22 with Eon. I'm a little bit like a kid in a candy store because, to be honest, for the first 15 years, it was a struggle. We were always on the bleeding edge. Uh, and it's only the last five years when the kind of the practical, the technology, the market has caught up with our vision, right? It's a bit like artificial intelligence for the last 20 years where experienced the winter where you almost ridiculed if you pick that as a, a path. Um, but now it's coming and uh, it, it is very nice because I'm 58, 59 soon. And uh, to, to see, to have so much to look forward. And I'm not talking about my company or our company, I'm talking about this field in general. Um, and I, I have a sense that it's not only XR. I surely, um, I'm a very good, uh, I love podcasts, right? So I'm very curious of what happens in the medical arena. I, I was listening the other day to a, a gentleman, uh, Dr. Uh, David Sinclair. He, he's researching in in life prolongation and, and, and we're looking at genes. So there's many, many fields that are uh, super exciting. What I'm getting to this, just to land the aircraft, um, is that it's difficult to predict what's happening just three years and impossible to predict what's happening the next 10 years. Literally impossible because there could be so drastic changes. And uh, I had an interview not long ago with uh, Academy Award winning John Guetta. He is famous for, among other things, that he did uh, Matrix. He's the one that got the bullet time and is a famous Hollywood guy, and but also he was senior vice president for Magic Leap, the $3 billion investment from, and many others, Lucasfilm. And I was talking about, okay, education, but education is to be in a context of society. So I asked him the question, how is the society, in your opinion, 10 years from now? And he talked about the XR extended cities. Uh, and he talked about sensors, so a marriage between IoT um, artificial intelligence, uh, and then um, I would say the third, data, and the human is in the middle. And the machines are communicating with each other very fast at light speed. And the human, we have chemical processes in our brain, so we communicate at a fraction of that speed. And there is two lines here. We were talking about two lines. One, where artificial intelligence expands, like Elon Musk takes very quickly, and the human is left behind and becomes more and more citizen salary kind of thing where we focus on enjoyment and a few of the humans will be very active. 
and the machine becomes smart and take over. We become victims, so to speak, for this. That's one alternative. And the other alternative is that we somehow find a connection with the machine. So we in the middle use things like artificial intelligence, um, augmented reality, so we can get that information flow at very fast speed and then empower, stand in the shoulders of giants this and become human 2.0, something more. I mean, we are today human one point something because with that, with this, right? We, we know everything, I, I, but the question is what happens um, which of these alternatives do you believe in? That's my question. Long well, it, it is certainly right. You know, the positive perspective, the the, the scary perspective. By, by nature, I'm an optimist. I, I, there are dangers, right? We don't know, but darn, it's going to be fun to find out. Um, I, I think if we focus too much on, on what could happen, the bad and the negative, our reaction then is to shy away from it. And we, we can't stop the future. We can't stop progression. We can't stop what we're going to learn. And it, it, we can't. So, so be careful, be cautious, think critically. Um, but, but this roller coaster is going. And I, I think we, we have to do our best to adapt, set ourselves up for the most amount of success and, and see where it goes. You, you know, um, some of it's scary, but it's also very exciting. Yeah, and I think the role of education is is let's let's make sure we're on that roller coaster too. I don't want to be left behind. No, and education. Here's my view: that I see education a thousand years from now having a very important role on all aspects. You need a mentor. Confucius had a mentor. Aristoteles was a mentor to Alexander. We need to learn, and we are social animals, and. I don't believe in a cold way. It would be also ridiculous. Imagine that you learn from home and you are with, in a kitchen with your mother learning. And eventually you need to go and interact with other people of all, all genders and et cetera to have a social relation, right? So, so what I'm saying is school provides so many dimensions and so much richness. Uh, yes, we have to change, and yes, we have to adapt. Otherwise, we'll not survive. But that's applicable for any industry, not just education. So, yeah, I, I share your optimism, really. I'm so excited. I wake up not only for VR near, but for almost any any field I'm looking at. I'm so excited to hopefully see the first man landing on Mars. I'm so excited to see breakthrough in, in Neuralink, where you can help people that are handicapped and paralyzed and suddenly can walk again. And almost anywhere I look, and if we can, in education, convey that excitement uh, and that multitude of options and enjoyment and steer away from what I think technology is dark side, uh, TikTok, with all due respect, I don't want to pick on a company, but this, this uh, fake or junk information that is destructive, dividing, uh, and makes us miserable, quite frankly, uh, if we can show the good path, right? And yeah. I think that's where education can play a very important role, right? Uh, yeah. How you can achieve, because ultimately we all want to have fulfilling lives and be happy and have a family and think that we leave this earth a little bit better than we came. And I think their education can take a role that Silicon Valley doesn't seem to want to take, except there's exception, of course. But so that's why I'm so optimistic about education. Yeah. Sorry, I, I talk too much, but it's so uh, there's not often I, I get to meet someone that has such a passion for what you do. And um, I want to thank you so much. Anything, last words before we end? No, it's it's been a pleasure. I, I, I share your enjoyment of just having conversations about the future and, and what it could be. And um, you know, knowledge is 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 a powerful thing, and mm -hmm. I think it can be used in ways that appeals to our um, lowest levels. You gave some examples, right? But mm -hmm. if we can use that same kind of technology and approach to really promote knowledge and and um, bigger perspectives and, and diversity and all those kinds of things, you know, using the power for good, mm -hmm. um, boy, we can just we can do wonderful things. And on that high note, I thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. 
all the best and looking forward to start working together properly in the next coming years. All, thank, thank you. you. All Take the care. Best. Thank you. Bye.